Do you want to know when structure play is okay? I'm Nicolene Peck and I teach all over the world about parenting and good communication, how to build strong family bonds, and about child development and education. I do all of this through the lens of the principle self-government. And in this video, we are talking about structured play. <laughs> talking about structure play and unstructured play and when structured play is actually okay. Some people think that playing structured is always damaging and unstructured is always the best and other people think the reverse. Why is that? Let's talk about that. So why do people love structured play? Well, because when people are playing in a structured way with a certain amount of time, certain supplies, they have a certain outcome, they actually almost always accomplish their goal. People love to check off lists, they love to accomplish their goal, so structured play just makes parents and teachers and everybody else happy. It's a way to know the child is getting all the lessons that they need, or at the very least just check we did playtime today. They had it. That's fine. There was something good and positive in the day. So this is why people love structured play. But in recent years, people have recognized that the effort to structure the life of a child, which is actually a good thing, children thrive in structure, can be overdone though. They've recognized that when you're structuring a person's life, that you can actually get to the point where they could soon not trust themselves to even be able to play or to invent or to problem solve because they haven't had enough unstructured play. So we all know that unstructured play leads to increased confidence, to increased problem solving abilities, usually better interpersonal skills, creativity, and just that overall fun that children look back on with fond memories on their childhood anyway. So so what is the point of structured play then? Is it always bad? The answer is no. There are many times when structured play is just what is needed to help a person. So let's talk about the best ways to use structured play. So if you've been on this channel for a while, then you know that everything on this channel is about self-government. So self-government is being able to determine the cause and effect of any given situation and possessing a knowledge of your own behaviors so that you can control them. That means that the goal of this whole channel is for each person, parents and children included, to learn how to govern themselves, how to control themselves, how to plan for themselves. Is this something that is just naturally learned? Yes and no. We do learn how to associate with other people and how to solve problems by being around other people and by experiencing things on our own, but also by witnessing how other people solve the same types of problems. Parents are the number one teachers in a child's life. And so when a parent is actively teaching their child something, the child is more likely to be successful and to remember those things. In fact, there are many stories of children who are not deliberately trained and taught by their parents, and those children struggle interacting socially or maybe developing a good work ethic or a good study habit or just learning how to solve their own problems, whether they're emotional problems or physical problems, because it is up to the parents to do that training for the child. The training is usually done in, in a structured way, although some training of children is done unstructured, where a child will just see how a parent handles a problem and then apply some of that knowledge later. But not all children are always paying attention to what the parent is doing, so deliberate training has its place too. This channel is all about being deliberate. If you've subscribed to this channel already, then you know I teach certain skills, like the four basic skills and how to correct behaviors in a calm way, how to self-regulate. Those types of things are all things that are deliberately planned for. They don't just accidentally happen, but they are beneficial to a child. So can you deliberately prepare a person to play better? And how would you do that? So I like to use structured play to prepare for some good unstructured play. 
So unstructured play is going to be the type of play where a child is inventive, creative. They are actually problem solving, assessing, seeing how they can do better at fixing something, building something, baking something, okay? The structured play is the perfect thing to lead into some good unstructured play and unstructured confidence. So if the parent at first teaches a child how to do something, then the child now has a new skill to use later for unstructured play. So let's say you teach a child how to pound a nail. Well, that information is going to help them build a clubhouse or a tree house later because now they can take mom and dad's nails and hammer and they could use it to make the clubhouse for themselves. So that's something that's going to benefit them. If you teach them how to be safe in the kitchen, how to use knives when cutting things, or how to properly measure things because you did it in a structured way, training your child, maybe you cooked with them a number of times so that there was a structure that was established for how to do the cooking in a way that's gonna make sure you get the greatest outcomes, then when they're inventing their own recipe, they're probably still going to measure the things so that they know if they put too much of this or not enough. Giving them that structured background or that backbone to their play will help them become more unstructured. Now this brings me to creativity in play. I think when people think of unstructured play they often think the very most of being creative in play and I definitely believe that creative play has its place for children imagining, pretending to be different characters, to pretending to be in a different scenario so that you can pretend to solve other problems are all very beneficial things. I like to train my children how to play creatively. Now I know that sounds a little bit like, well then it's not unstructured if you're training them how to play creatively. No, I'm just letting them witness creative play. So many parents have lost touch with their creative side, but I have not. I love to play creatively. I love to invent. Maybe that's why I like to write articles and you know blogs and stuff like that and create things that help other people because there's this creative side of me, this inventive side of me that I like to nurture and I love to do it with the children. I love to get out a, a bottle of bubbles and see do you think we could make these into other shapes? Do you think, and I start asking scientific questions and then we start playing in a way that they hadn't planned on, maybe I hadn't even planned on it. So I play unstructured with them. So I deliberately plan, that's structured, to play unstructured with my children. So I might start pretending something, like pretending that we live in the forest and we have to go find berries and different things to eat. Well, my children maybe have never learned that in the forest you could find berries to eat to live on, but now they do because I played it with them. Then after that, when they're playing with friends, they're probably gonna bring in some of that other play and they'll start imagining from there. I have a little granddaughter named Clara. Right now she's two and a half. I've decided this is a great time to start teaching Clara some of the old fairy tales like Little Red Riding Hood and the Three Little Pigs and the, the Little Engine That Could and Jack and the Beanstalk, those types of things because they're just part of cultural literacy, right? So I taught Clara about the three little pigs. Now Clara thought this story was very fascinating. I had no idea that her two-year-old brain would get so infatuated with the idea of a big bad wolf. But she thought this big bad wolf was interesting. And I realized after the fact, well, she doesn't really think of most things as bad or scary. So this is one of the first scary things, scary creatures that she would be introduced to in her life. So of course she's going to get interested in this. So of course when we went on to Little Red Riding Hood and how that story has a big bad wolf too, oh my goodness, of course she was learning more about the bad wolf, the cunning ways, the lies that the big bad wolf tells. So anyway, when I taught her the story and we talked about it, we drew it on a whiteboard as I was telling it to 
to her. And then we read it in a book after the fact. We even watched a video of it. All of those things would be considered structured play, where I'm like, how am I going to introduce her to this story? And what could she do? Well, after I introduced her to the story, she started doing things on her own. And I did not comment on those things that she was doing on her own. She started imagining that she was the big bad wolf and that she was trying to get the little piggies to let her in their houses. And so she would go up to a place on the floor and she would say, little piggy, you are first little piggy and you are this, and she would start acting out the story and talking down to the floor, pretending that she saw a little piggy there. Before I knew it, the whole countenance of the big bad wolf had changed. <laughs> the big bad wolf was saying nice things like, I'm nice, little piggy. I love you, little piggy. It's okay. I'm not a big bad wolf. And now those of us who know the story and how cunning and how many lies the big bad wolf tells would go, yeah, that's very characteristic of what a big bad wolf would say if he was trying to get in. But she truly in her mind and heart had changed the story. She wanted the wolf and the pigs to get along and the little conversations that they were having were absolutely darling. I wish I would have videotaped it. I could have shown you how sweet and how deliberate she was. And then later when we talked about the three little pigs, her daddy came home from work and she wanted to tell her daddy about the three little pigs. And she brought her daddy to the place where she was pretending to talk to the three little pigs. She didn't bring him to the whiteboard or to the story or say, let's show daddy the three little pigs on YouTube. She brought him to the place where she was imagining the three little pigs and she was pointing it out to him and showing it to him. And she had done all of that all on her own. That's the beauty of unstructured play, but it started with structured play. It started with me giving her the idea. I think the whole point of structured play is to set the children free, to have more unstructured play. Now, sometimes we only have a certain time limit and we are with a large group of people. That's also when structured play comes in very handy. But by and large, we wanna have a balance of the both, structured and unstructured play. And that way the child gets to have the opportunity to problem solve and make decisions. If you've enjoyed this video, I'm pretty sure you will love my next video that is all about unstructured play. So it offers 10 ways that you can create unstructured play for your children. So click on the link to that video next.